Hello, and welcome to today's episode of Scurf Interviews. This is actually the first in our second mini-series where we're going to be exploring uh, questions around treasury management and funding public goods. And this mini-series is produced in collaboration with RMIT, and I'm very excited to uh, have Chris and Darcy from RMIT uh, and Bull Trapper or Bull from uh, the Yearn community to get to actually dive into some of these questions today uh, so we can explore that. So first things first, let's go around and do some quick intros. So I'll hand it off to you, Chris, as the other host. Awesome. Thanks, Eugene. I'm really excited to have this um, conversation today because it's such a important topic and such an important series. My name is Chris Berg. As Eugene has mentioned, I'm a co-founder of the RMIT Blockchain Innovation Hub, which is a um, business school research center into um, blockchain technology. We were established in 2017. Um, and my, my area, I'm a crypto economist, so I look at a lot of blockchain governance um, things like treasury management with Darcy, who will introduce himself in a moment. Um, lots of crypto economic design, tokenomics, and and really all the stuff that you could get an economist to do in this in, in this incredible space. Great, thank you. Bull, do you mind jumping in next? Sure, I'm Bull. I'm a contributor at Urine Finance. It's a yield aggregator on the Ethereum blockchain. I've been working with Urine since near the beginning, and I come from the traditional finance realm but I'm a crypto native and have been in the space for quite some time. So most of my responsibilities and work that I do with Urine relate to budget, uh, treasury management, farming of assets, and you know, it's, uh, making sure there's sufficient runway and financial help of the organization. Great, thank you, Bull. Uh, Darcy, you mind jumping in? Fantastic, my name is Darcy Allen. I am an economist, a senior research fellow at the RMIT Blockchain Innovation Hub. Um, I'm an economist working on blockchains, got into this space around 2015, 2016, very interested in the governance of blockchains and all of that involves and a big part of that at the moment, um, as perhaps we approach some kind of crypto winter is treasury management, um, how are we going to get through that? Um, and also, how do you do that in the context of a DAO? Um, we're doing this in a very open ecosystem. Um, so excited to be here, excited to have a chat. Thanks for having me. Of course, yeah, thank you all for joining. And so to kick off the, the conversation for today, I kind of want to start with the uh, very high level question of, well, why is treasury hard in the first place? What, what is it about it that fundamentally makes it so complicated? I can talk about that. Um, in terms of in crypto projects, treasury is difficult because one, a lot of the crypto application projects, they're not making much money, actually. They're, they're not getting much cash flow from earnings. And um, so it's hard because if you're not making money, then how do you build your treasury? And then two, there's there's inherent volatility that's not uh, in typical in like normal companies, but they are in crypto because you know the assets are very volatile. So it makes it it makes it challenging to to balance the volatility of the markets and be you know adequately hedged no matter what happens with the markets. And on top of that, because urine is a DAO and a lot of the projects and um, things in crypto are DAOs. It's a little bit challenging because there's no CFO, there's no, you know, quote unquote CFO. It's a decentralized community of contributors. So sometimes it's it's slower to get consensus. You know, there's not one person writing checks. So that makes um, things slightly more difficult than a normal organization for Treasury. I, I completely agree with all of that. Um, so what, what we have here, when we're talking about treasuries, um, we're talking about really a pool of collectively owned digital assets, um, typically earmarked for funding some kind of local public goods within an ecosystem. Um, the problem is we don't know what local public goods we need, and we also want to protect the treasury at the same time. Um, and we try and create governance structures that attempt to overcome those dual problems at the same time. Now, this is a really hard problem for a number of reasons um, that are quite unique to blockchain. Um, we have an open, open ecosystem, right? So early decisions about a treasury might be made by particular stakeholders, early founders and so on. Um, but over time, as an ecosystem grows, there's a lot more stakeholders. Um, and also the incentives of those stakeholders change and they might not necessarily be aligned. So there's this, we're trying to figure out who owns the treasury. They're trying to make decisions about what to do with the treasury under extreme uncertainty. Um, that's, that's a really hard problem. Um, 
and it creates some really interesting dynamics that this tends to happen in public. Um, it's really quite fascinating reading these forums about tre treasury diversification and treasury management um, and all of the different perspectives that are, that are coming in there from the, from the ecosystem itself. So there's a lot of things that make it complicated, the things that make blockchain governance itself quite complicated and hard but very, very important. Uh, Bull, I might throw to you. Um, it strikes me looking at some of these debates about how we should use treasuries, how we should manage treasuries, that there's not really uniform agreement on what a treasury is actually there for. Is it, um, is it there to fund public goods? Is it there to fund um, public goods that, that the ecosystem might care about or crypto in general might care about? Or should we be um, using it to fund ongoing operations, or should we just build up a war chest? Do, is that a fair description that you know that the even before we get to how we're going to spend it, it's not totally clear that there's consensus over what it is there for in the first place? You know, working uh, on behalf of Treasury, you're you're a steward to governance, and you're a steward to the governance token holders. But at the same time, it's an operation. Um, you know, there's earnings, there's expenses, so. Urine in particular has created an innovative model where there are certain teams, there's a uh, Y teams they call them, which a urine contributor track has developed that we implement. And these, these smaller teams operate as stewards on behalf of governance on token holders, and they can be changed out by votes by token holders. So in particular, there's a budget team that you know manages the treasury and they do things that need to be done in order to keep operations going and also to fund growth for new developers, new projects, new initiatives. Um, and then also, you know, returning or acting on behalf of governance holders. So one of our urine improvement proposals was that earnings are going to be used to buy back urine tokens to be decided what to do with at a later date. So um, th those are kind of the things that urine has done to tackle some of those those problems that you mentioned, which I think we have a good solution uh, doing that because, you know, you can't ask the token holders every time you need to send, make an expense out like, hey, do we approve this or, or not? Because that's just far too cumbersome. So we've developed um, smaller Y teams that act on behalf of governance token holders as stewards. And, uh, you know, our primary focus is uh, keep operations running, fund developers, onboard new developers, help out operations that we need to keep the protocol running and, you know, think about growth and also being um, hedged against volatile crypto prices or something that could shut down operations. So we're doing all that simultaneously. I completely agree with that. that that's really interesting. Um, I take a little bit more of a theoretical perspective, I guess, around why do treasuries exist? Um, I think there's two broad reasons. The first one is very obvious and it's the one that most treasuries state. We, we have a treasury because it's there to fund some kind of local public goods. We don't tend to define them very well. We, we say those local public goods are research, development, marketing, ecosystem incentives, um, whatever the ecosystem might need in the future. Now, that's really interesting because um, we need treasuries because blockchains don't have governments, but they might need some goods that would be underprovided by effectively private stakeholders within the ecosystem. So we're thinking about infrastructure, bridges, um, all of the, those sort of aspects. And so we use a treasury as a mechanism to try and fund those goods. So that's the first reason we have them because of local public goods funding. But the second reason, um, and I think it's a little bit underappreciated is that treasuries act as a really important costly signal to the ecosystem. Having a large perhaps undiversified treasury of a native token uh, can signal to your ecosystem that this is a long-term play. Um, we're going to be here for a long time. We have a really long runway. We're confident in our token price and the value of the ecosystem. Um, we see this in other fields in economics, this idea of costly signaling. The classic example is, is education. You go to university to signal some traits that you have, you might be hardworking or dedicated or whatever. Um, you go and do a costly thing. You spend four years at college or university to demonstrate to employers those traits. In the same way, we can think of a treasury as demonstrating some kind of credible commitment to the community. Um, now, there's 
There's some arguments about whether that signal gets diluted over time when everyone has a big treasury. Um, we're yet to see that. Um, but I think, yeah, there's, there's two broad reasons, local public goods funding and then sort of signaling to your community that you, you have a large treasury itself. To ask a follow on question there, I wanted to see building on that, what are the particular complexities of treasury management in the Web3 space relative to just generally thinking about organizational health and budgeting and making sure, you know, you have the money to, to fill your operations or fund uh, public goods in a, in, in a geographic area? Sort of what are the unique challenges in the Web3 space around that? Well, I think also Web3, it's interesting because it's a very young industry. Uh, people you know, they're, they, a lot of people, they're, they're younger and they just, they just know crypto. So I come also before crypto from the traditional finance space. So I know how businesses should be run, how operations should be run, how things should be funded, how you should be looking at costs and expenses. So the first thing that I've done and I did when working with you is we need to know like our run rate, our balance sheet. I made a complete balance sheet income statement that we monitor monthly and it's all made public. Um, we have Wi-Fi stats, we have quarterly financial reports, year-end financial reports that put all this information public so people can see what is in Treasury and how things are getting spent and, and stuff like that. Well, how have you found the community respond to that? I mean, that's a, that's a level of financial, um, I guess, sophistication or um, financial assurance that most protocols uh, don't have. Is that welcomed by the community or is that seen as a an unnecessary constraint in the wild Web3 world? Yeah, I, I've seen it as being very welcomed. So we publish our financial reports, our quarterly ones, and they've been praised for their transparency and their level of detail that people are surprised how professional they are. And that also signals to our community that uh, you know, we are professional. We know what we're doing. We have things under control. We're not just spending frivolously, and, and uh, you know, we're not doing things that we shouldn't be doing. And it's all public. And and I've seen in the in the crypto space, the Web three space, that people have been modeling uh, the reports after the report that we innovated and have become to be more transparent and clear on everything that's going on. So I think the community very responsive and well received by uh, the things that we're publishing and showing and how we're um, you know, managing it as, as a steward for governance. Darcy, to bring you in here, what, what Bull is describing is actually quite a, I, mean, I don't know how high cost it is, but it's a high level of governance assurance that you as a community would need to allocate resources to. You've studied a lot about um, blockchain governance um, and, uh, and, and foundation governance and crypto governance more generally. Uh, where do you think we are in the levels of sophistication about dedicating resources to that sort of what we might um, uh, view as sort of hierarchical organization or um, the sort of governance that you would see in, in the corporate sector? I think the tide is turning on this and I think it's great, Bull, what what you're doing at Yearn, creating these sort of these sub teams um, and then having transparency as well around, um, after the fact. And there's still this sentiment that everything should happen, every decision should be thrown out to a DAO and I think that's slowly coming back to maybe we need some discretionary power, maybe we need some sub teams or committees uh, who are uh, undertaking those treasury management activities. What's really important from there is that we have some sort of feedback loop to those teams so that the community still has some sort of overarching control of it. But I do think we're moving into a world where when you're structuring a DAO early on, it will become just a staple that you put within your governance design that you have some kind of treasury management team. Now, that's not really the case at the moment, but I'm hoping over time that will be built in. Um, and I think that's a really healthy, healthy thing to have um, because not everything can be thrown out to the DAO for a vote, but it's really important that your community has a really good feeling about what's going on and they feel like if something... Um, doesn't gel quite right with them, that they have some avenue um, to, to, to change that outcome. And what we've seen really with treasury diversification so far are um, discourse posts or discord posts or forum posts um, that say, okay, we're gonna sell 
5% um, of our treasury token to these 20 VCs at a 30% discount. And the community jumps in and says that discount's huge um, and it's not vested for long enough and um, this isn't a good strategic play and so on. So I think those discussions are really healthy, but at the same time, we do need some more discretionary power within particular teams and committees to make these decisions. So, Bull, um, we start in, in most protocols with a pre-allocation to Treasury, um, so of the, of the local token. Um, but obviously, uh, and, and you know, put, put that aside and hopefully the, the token grows in value so the Treasury itself is, is, um, has some substantial wealth in it. But of course, there are other ways to fill up our Treasury and there are other things that we can do with the Treasury as well apart from just pushing out grants and so forth. Um, you could use ongoing revenue sources um, like transaction fees or so forth, or just putting fees in the system and you pop it into the treasury in, in either your local token or in, in a stable coin or what have you. Or um, uh, on the other hand, you could also pay the treasury out to, to token holders as well. So even before we get to treasury management, there are a lot of choices that we have to make about you know funds go funds going in and funds going out how do you start i mean in your experience how has yearn been thinking through should we pay dividends should we be filling up our treasury or um uh, and more generally how do you think that the space has evolved in that in that thinking yeah and i want to add to the prior question is that i think yearn is the most transparent and well run DAO in DeFi and web3 and we've always had a treasury management um you know function since the beginning and everything that treasury does is on behalf of token holders and they're all done in accordance to yips and government's proposals that have been approved by governance holders so there, there's still um you know if governance wants to change members of the multi-sig or change the org around or they don't like the white the y teams or how things are being structured they they always have the ability to do that and voice concerns and make changes so we only operate as um, you know, approved yips that have been uh, voted on by the DAO. Yeah, so I think Yearn is, is a very successful organization within DeFi and Web3 because it's actually making money. You know, it makes two to three million net profit every month after we pay operations team and all that. And and you know, one of the key governance proposals in recent times is what you just mentioned is like, what do we do with our earnings? So governance has voted we take our earnings and we use it to buy back our tokens. So we were buying back about two to three million per month that should be increasing in the native token. Um, and that's all from a governance approved proposal. There's some discussions on in the governance forums or within the community of should we be changing um, kind of this value accrual mechanism. So those are still go ongoing, but everything that we do, we do based on uh, approved governance uh, yips, you're an improvement proposals. I mean, that's a, that's a really interesting thing. And obviously, as you've described it, um, Yearn, um, you, you are implementing the governance proposal. So it's, you know, you, you contribute to those discussions, but obviously they're not your discussions necessarily um, uh, to, to decide solely. But it is interesting to think about, let's say if, if a DAO like Yearn or um, just a, a crypto DAO is a startup, well, a lot of token holders have been um, calling for exactly what, what that is, which is try to take the treasury and try to get it to um, revert the value of the treasury to revert back to token holders. Effectively, in some way, paying dividends like a traditional company would. But it does strike me, and I, 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 I'm just interested in your perspective, it strikes me that if these are startup companies or if these are startup companies in the real world, then paying out dividends, returning a treasury to, um, uh, to shareholders is, is, is remarkable at this early stage. Um, of, of the industry, and and um, do you think that they do you think that the, we're making the right choices, or do you think that maybe even the incentive structures have to be worked on to make sure that when we get treasury, we're actually spending it and building out the protocol, or or am I or am I making a problem out of nothing? It's definitely an issue of, of balancing growth of the protocol and also returning value. So, um, you know. We, we look at both and we, we, what we've done in recent times is grow the team, grow the developers, make sure they're all properly compensated and incentivized while also providing a good product, which I think is one of the best products in DeFi. And the product uh, actually makes money. So a lot of protocols 
they don't have this luxury of how, how do they determine how to do some of these things or fund growth or, or return value because they're not really generating much value. So Yearn generates a lot of value. And right now it's using it to buy back the tokens. And, you know, the community is determining, are we going to change the value accrual to be uh, something else? So, you know, those things are to be decided by the community. Darcy, to bring you in here, do you do you, do you accept that this is an interesting challenge? Um, obviously, there's a lot of uh, communities that would like to earn yield or, or on their tokens, or they'd like these buybacks and and or burn functions to make sure that you know their token holders are uh, their their token value is growing relative to um, uh, the rest of the crypto economy. Um, it, it, do you think that we're making the right decisions in that sort of tokenomic structuring, or do you think we've got a way to go? I think it's quite ecosystem specific. So in, in some ecosystems, it's a little bit clearer about what the treasury might be um, funding, that there's sort of a lot of growth potential there that maybe a lot more should be ploughed into the grant, the grant program or some developer program or whatever it happens to be. Um, in others, and it sounds like in Yearn, and I'm, I'm not deeply versed in Yearn, but um, if you've got those ongoing revenue sources and that seems very sort of clear and predictable, then I think you do have a different, different equation there. Um, so it is ecosystem specific. Um, I do think in general, I would like to see more uh, treasuries being spent on ecosystem development. Um, a lot of that might look wasteful to the community members themselves. Of course, they're going to prefer some sort of buyback and a, and a token um, in token appreciation. But um, as you said, these are often early stage ecosystems um, and uh, a lot of decisions can get caught up in caught up in gridlock, but it's very ecosystem specific. Bull, um, uh, when we start these treasuries, those treasuries are filled up with just our native token, which you know we hope is very valuable, but is often not very valuable. Um, uh, and I think a lot of treasuries and a lot of DAOs have come to realize that, well, they need to diversify away from their native token, certainly if they're going to be um, uh, if, if they're going to feel safer in if there's a crypto winter, but even if there's a if there's a downturn in the fortunes of their individual protocol, uh, this is something that you've thought a lot about. Where, where do you start thinking about the choices that we have to make if we could if we are going to pursue a, a strategy of treasury diversification? Yeah, and I just want to add, you know, all the comments. And things that I'm saying are just my own personal views. They don't represent other contributors at Urine or the community. This is just based on my experiences working at Urine and previously in the traditional finance realm. But Urine is unique in that uh, Treasury wasn't funded with the native governance token. It was a fair launch uh, protocol where you know the tokens were given out to community members uh, for free for providing liquidity last July, and Treasury itself did not have any tokens. So there was, uh, you know, that poses several issues. And there was a governance proposal in January of this year to mint more tokens to give to Treasury and for contributors so they can be incentivized and people could be well compensated. So, you know, one of the, the important things that I saw early on was like, it needs to be diversified. There needs to be cash to fund operations to weather down, downstorm in the market and, um, in January, we were a negative 11 million in debt, and now we have about 27 million in cash, plus, um, you know, a substantial amount of the native token in Treasury, about 78 million. So I think we've been very successful in diversifying uh, Treasury to uh, be agnostic to market conditions and also growing it to be consistently growing our cash balances uh, to ensure the health of the ecosystem and operations can continue and and stuff like that. So what, what should you be diversifying into? So obviously um, you can diversify into cash, but you've got a huge range of alternative assets. You could diversify into sort of blue chip crypto, uh, ETH, you could diversify into blue chip DeFi. One of which, of course, would be Yearn, but you know, Uni or so forth. But how, how do you think about the the op, the the menu of options there? Well, well, the way I think about Yearn is that at the end of the day, it is a business. It is a business with expenses, and there's overhead, 
and urine historically has a lot of, of its balance sheet in crypto assets eth bitcoin urine so i think it's always been short in cash so my my aim and my goals from the last 11 months was to increase the cash balances so that it can pay for operations and fund growth and stuff like that so you know we've diversified um by increasing our cash balances that we need to fund operations to keep the lights on to keep things going so um you know nothing against uni, uni but uh in yearn's case it's best for long-term growth of the protocol and the operations team and everything to have um, a sufficient cash balance to be agnostic to the market and that's how we have diversified ourselves and our treasury to you know benefit the token holders the protocol and you know everyone in DeFi that's using the urine product um I, I just wanted to jump in and say well, what's really interesting is i think diversification means very different things to very different to different ecosystems right so i think over the last six months we've seen a lot of treasuries that have uh, a different approach to yearn right they started with a, a bunch of their native token within their treasury and then they decided we need to diversify um we need to diversify in particular because a crypto winter is coming. We need to fund our operating expenses and so on and so forth. And so um, let's sell some of our um, native token for USDC. But what's been wrapped up in that is this idea of strategic diversification. So it's not just diversification because we, um, we need some stable coin to cover operating expenses. It's we care who we're giving our native token to. So these um, VCs that we're selling the token to, um, who are they? What value are they providing to us in addition to um, just buying our token at a discount? And this is all, it, it's really wrapped up. It's not just a, um, a financial decision of diversifying a portfolio to get through winter. It's also that those tokens that you're selling have governance rights and that might actually be quite a large portion of governance rights in your ecosystem um, and we're seeing this play out in public quite often about how that relationship how that relationship works i mean darcy so i mean communities don't always love treasury diversification because um uh, treasury diversification certainly poorly done looks a hell of a lot like you're dumping tokens out on the market and trading them for us dollars um uh, how do you uh, from from your perspective um, how do you see the um, the sort of group communal decision making of the DAO affecting the ability of treasury managers to make those sorts of choices? It's it's really hard. So on on, on one end, um, you can see an argument why some of these deals need to be made um, in private with a multi sig, um, which has happened in some ecosystems. Um, and in other ones, they go out to um, the Discord or the, the um, discourse and everyone chips in um, and there's kind of some odd negotiation between the community and the token buyers. Um, and that's, that's super interesting to play out. Um, what I think we're getting from this happening in public is we're getting a lot of public learning and discovery about how this should happen or how to diversify a treasury. Um, and yeah, it's interesting to see where we go from here, but I think we've learned a lot just in the last six months about what community members think about what a reasonable discount is on selling your tokens or how long it should be vested for. Um, when should the governance rights kick in? Uh, it's really interesting to, to see all of this. And I just want to add on that uh, actually too, and you know, part of the urine tokens in treasury, how, how you know, w we don't um, really sell them to VCs. I don't think VCs in crypto add much value because there are people like me uh, in urine that are DeFi crypto natives. There's people like Bantag, there's people like Andre, like adding a VC with a discount does not really add much value to urine in exchange for tokens. So what we do is, you know, we reward it to contributors that are actually adding value to the protocol where they're helping with marketing, they're helping with the web revamp, their developers are doing treasury stuff. Um, you know, all these other things that are adding value, not just being freeloaders, because I don't think VCs in our particular case add um, really any value for what we're doing. Um, it's more like rewarding contributors and people that are going to help the product be better, which is essentially a DeFi public good. 
Paul, I mean, w- one of the things that we can do with our treasury um, is we can put it to work. So uh, I know that in a lot of communities, there's um, discussion about, well, so let, we've got a lot of USDC. Why don't we um, yield farm that? Um, uh, at the limit, why don't we take half our treasury and pop it into the latest um, Olympus Dow fork? Um, obviously, you know, there, there are risky options and there are less risky options. But um, I'm sure the UN community has discussed the possibility of using its treasury to earn more treasury. How have you started to think about or tackle that 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 option? Yeah, and, and we've been doing that for quite some time. We actually do have uh, CDPs open with some of our urine tokens held in treasury and we're earning yield on them. Uh, we earn about over a million dollars a year um, just from that. And then we also have used our cash balances to all be earning yield in our urine products. So it's something that we've thought about. I've kind of spearheaded early on when we had uh, a large treasury balance that wasn't really yielding anything. So we're always focused on managing our debt, earning yield on our assets and growing the treasury. Um, you know, if, if community members feel very strongly about going to an home fork, personally, I probably would be against that. But, you know, they're, they're free to, um, you know, make those proposals to governance and, you know, treasury and the multi-sig is going to act on behalf of any valid proposal. But most of our stuff is earning yield in uh, on our assets into urine products. So, you know, urine is using urine is something that we, we've talked about before. How, how do you think about risk, though, in that context? So obviously there are more risky strategies, there are less risky strategies. There are risk across lots of different margins, not just um, uh, the risk of volatility, but also smart contract risk. So, right. you know, obviously, obviously this is up to governance, as you've said, but, you know, when you're advising the community, about you know how much how much should we be aping into weird things? Um, where do you start? Yeah. Um, you know we're fairly risk averse, and we're always monitoring our debt and our collateralization levels, and they're very over collateralized. And um, the, all the things that we're farming, or earning interest on, are essentially cash and carry trades. So you know we're not using treasury assets to mint debt and then buy. Uh, Bitcoin and speculating on that, you know, they're all just cash and carry trades. Let's let's mint something at, you know, one to two to five percent and earn 15, 20, 25 percent. Um, and, you know, if, if there's an adverse event in the market, we pay down our debt, protect our capital, which we've done successfully. Um, so we're, we're fairly risk reverse and we have that ability to still earn yield because of the balance sheet is so big. Darcy, what would you? What, how do you think about the opportunity to, you know, put the cash to work or put the put the treasury to work? Given that we've got this huge menu of um, traditional financial products or strange, um, uh, weird DeFi and DeGen, uh, DeFi DeGen stuff. I think it goes back to why are we effectively diversifying in the first place? So if, if if you're trying to manage your treasury just so that you have a um, a runway, then um, you can just keep it in USDC or whatever it happens to be um, and not take on that additional risk. If you're actually looking to grow the value of the treasury over time in its own for its own good, um, then you can take on those risks. But I think it, it looks different depending on what your purpose is of the treasury management that you're you're trying to achieve. At Yearn, you know, we're looking, we look at both, you know, to have runway, have 18 months, two years runway, and also earn yield and increase the value of the balance sheet, uh, basically on, on behalf of governance. So a lot of the things that we're doing, the strategies, they're in, they're in well-tested, well-audited, well-looked at things like Curve, like, you know, this is kind of the most uh, looked at, the, the looked at, most looked at contracts in DeFi, you know, the, the Curve has billions of TVL. So um, I don't think the risk is as high as, as going into some some new, you know, dog uh, fork Ponzi on, on Matic or something like that. You know, we, we don't really do any of that. And our aim is, you know, to, to, to diversify, to cover operations, to fund growth, which we're, we're doing both, to fund growth of the protocol so we can develop new products that add value to DeFi. And... Um, and also, you know, just increase the value of treasury over time. Bull, what do you think is working and what isn't working across the space? So obviously, Yearn has a um, relatively sophisticated approach to 
treasury management. But where do you think that the space is and where has it evolved, so, uh, particularly given that you've got an experience in traditional finance and have seen treasuries being managed in, in the real world? Yeah, I think Yearn is unique because it, it's a very successful product. And I think we're running treasury very successfully because we're very prudent with what we're doing and how we're earning yield and what we're spending our cash on. And Yearn makes money, as I've mentioned before. So I think a problem with a lot of protocols in DeFi is they're not actually making money. You know, if they take away the token subsidies or they take away um, any other uh, any other thing that's artificially making the protocol look better, they're operating at a net loss. So they're not cash flow positive, and and also they're not very transparent. Like uh, no one knows what's really going on with Treasury, but we are extremely transparent. We make all of our reports public. We have all of our wallets known, and we have dashboards. People can see what's going on. So on top of that, you know, we, we run a fairly sophisticated operation. I think a lot of other protocols in DeFi, they're very young, they're young, but they're run by young teams and, you know, they're, they come, they come upon a lot of money very quickly. So we'll, we'll see how they, they manage that. But, um, one of the main things that I, I, I saw with your and early on is I don't want it to end up like a dot com company you know they're spending money fruitlessly and it's not adding value and next thing you know you have no funding and you, you know you, you don't have any cash or anything to keep the the protocol going so we've avoided that and we're in a we're in a great position to you know do everything we can to make sure that doesn't happen and like other protocols in DeFi, i'm not sure that's the case so we'll just have to see what happens with with them Darcy, what advice would you give um, uh, a, a a young DAO to think about treasury management from um, day one? Uh, again, these protocols tend to be born with enormous treasuries and sometimes extremely highly valued treasuries. How would you how would you set yourself up for success? I think the challenge is in the very early stages, we don't know what a treasury is for, or even what it is that we're managing, or what the future value of it might be. Um, and that means that we end up with very broad sweeping purposes of a treasury and how it's managed, right? And the default there is, you know, we'll just put everything out to a, to a DAO vote and that's fine. Um, I think what we're going to see is a little bit, a little bit more specifics in that early stage around this is our approach to treasury, um, management. This is how we're going to approach the problem of having a runway through volatility, um, and sign it, kind of baking that in early on. Um, and that will look different in different ecosystems, but I think it'll just get more and more formalized right from the start when you can have more um, discretionary power from those early um, founders to write that into whatever the treasury or the foundation or whatever is meant to be doing. Um, so I think it'll just get more specific over time. And I think that will come out of the lessons that we're learning right now about, about how to do it. Um, or what the sort of best practices are. Um, but over time, I also think that we will see, I mean, you've got, you've got two broad approaches to manage your treasury. You either try and do it in-house, maybe through a committee or whatever it happens to be, or you effectively sort of buy those services over a market and use much more, um, use more professional services effectively, this make or buy sort of question. I think um, it'll be interesting to see how professional sort of treasury management fits into this story. Um, does it look like um, a token on token sets that underlying it is an actively managed um, uh, basket of assets that lots of different ecosystems buy? Um, but yeah, it looks very different in different protocols. Yeah, and I just want to add on that. I think, uh, you know, a lot of protocols, they would, they should and they would benefit greatly by having you know professionals such as myself or people with professional finance backgrounds that um, know how treasuries and businesses should be run and to be prudent so whether it's in-house or they have um, you know someone helping them advising on financial matters and you know generating formal balance sheet and income statements and run rates like they should be doing all these things to really know where they sit because you can't do treasury unless you know what is in treasury? What is the composition of treasury? What is our debt? What are our assets? You know, how much are we making? How much are we spending? So these are all things that are very important that um, I'm not sure some of these other new, newer protocols have wrapped their head around or have the professional competence, competency to do that. 
and, and and yeah, and what that might look like in process in practicality is having sort of sub teams or sub DAOs with professionals in it that may be elected or maybe, um, however they're appointed those for those positions. But I I completely agree with that. Yeah, and and, and with those uh, you know sub teams, it, it's my opinion that it's really not uh, practical or feasible to have a lot of the normal operations and and stuff like that all go through the DAO. It's just far too cumbersome. And um, sometimes you need to ap- act, um, you know, a little bit faster or, um, you know, on, on behalf of the DAO, but it's always in their best interest. But, you know, running like, hey, a governance forum post, like, hey, should we spend 25000 on this? And then it's like a week or something like th- this is that that's not really a, um, a good solution or a long term solution, really. So, you know, at Yearn, we've pioneered the smaller Y team committees to um do security to do comms to do operations to do marketing to do treasury to do budget to do farming to do all these things that you know need to be done um sometimes very fast especially security and stuff like that Uh, it's been interesting hearing this conversation because on the one hand we have this inherent new sector web three there's a lot of folks who are idea supposedly ideologically ideologically driven there's the folks who are just aping in for some kind of immediate returns uh no need to speculate on the proportions of the two but I, i i was sort of this made me think of an interesting tension, right? Because part of it very much sounds like, and I know just from reputation of sort of what uh, can set apart Yearn or some of the other very mature uh, organizations relative to sort of the, the vast majority of players in the space is that maturity. It is that kind of learning how to not just pretend we're in this green field, wild west kind of area, but recognizing there's actually decades, if not centuries of previous knowledge that can easily be integrated and applied. And... I want to come to a question around the culture of treasury management, because it seems as though depending on the initial crew who are launching a DeFi product, right, because, you know, there's a whole psychology of that that we can dig into in a separate podcast of why, why do people do the things they do. But at the end of the day, it's really hard to suss out any activity in the Web3 space with poten- from potential token holding and from potential gains and hodls and anything along those lines. So I, I would be interested from both of your perspectives, you know, if you were advising someone who comes to you and is like, hey, I really want to start a DeFi product, not just for the returns, or, but I, I really want to do this because I see Web3 as an important future infrastructure layer and I want to build on top of that. Uh, and I know both of you already touched on this in terms of the actual treasury management nuances, but how to think of the human and components to get people excited about maturity as opposed to just, well, who cares? Let's just do the thing that'll get them largest immediate returns. And, you know, how do you get the right culture around that for people to want to do the hard journey of let's grow up and mature and be the best version of ourselves? That's an incredibly difficult question. I'm not sure, Bull, do you have have any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, well, I I would like to just say that, um, you know, it's important to make sure everyone is properly incentivize long term and their skin in the game. So, you know, whether you have members of your treasury team, they're getting vested tokens, or they have other things that are looking to the long term health of the protocol, and, um, you know, the token as, as well, so that they're properly incentivized for, for, you know, long term viability. And I think uh, aligning the incentives, which we've done at Yearn with contributors is, is, is very critical to ensure that like, all parties are operating in the best interests of uh, the protocol and of token holders and of the contributors because the contributors themselves are token holders. So um, I think that's uh, the most effective way to deal with, with that. I think it's a, a really hard problem to solve. And in part, it goes back to what we were speaking about earlier that when you're talking about, for instance, of, um, for instance, diversifying your treasury or selling selling some of your treasury, um, it matters. It does matter who purchases them, right? And there is a very different vibe if it is going to VCs where it's locked for one year and maybe they'll dump a bunch of it after that year um, along their, their vesting schedule or whatever it happens to be. That has a very different feel to um, diversifying using a, a, a batch auction to the community or creating a smart pool and diversifying it that way. 
and it, it feels different. You end up with the same tokens at the end of the day, but the makeup of the community is very different and it gives a, a, a different vibe. Um, I'm not sure there's any easy answers to your question, Eugene. I'm not sure. Um, we'll, we'll figure that out over time, I guess. And so I guess to, to ask a more specific question then, you know, uh, Bull was mentioning the importance of incentive alignment, skin in the game. I mean, these are obviously important concepts in general uh, for Web3, given how game theoretic a lot of these things are. But I mean, are these incentives purely financial or have you seen any non-financial incentives also get rolled into the full schema of skin in the game for someone and why they should stick around in the long term? Well, I think, uh, you know, that, that's on an individual basis. Um, some people are going to be passionate about Web3. I'm, I'm passionate about Web3 and DeFi and, and what Yearn is doing in particular. So I'm going to be involved. Um, but there, there is a financial component that needs that's important. Um, so it, it's a hard question. I think it comes down to the individual person. Um, but, you know, we aim to reward people that are adding value within the community. And eventually they come on board, um, you know, as contributors to Yearn and have shown continuous uh, value so um i you know it's a hard question to, to answer i think there's there's definitely the financial component but also finding people that are passionate about and there's plenty of people within the urine community and urine contributors that are, that are passionate about urine you know bantig and a few of the other public people within urine they're very passionate about um what urine is doing and it's not solely financial compensation so i think you know making sure you you're getting people that aren't just looking for the quick buck is going to be the most long-term viable. And I mean, one of, one of the ways that we do that is we target our airdrops in very specific ways now compared, compared to previously. We, we will target it based on past behavior of demonstrating though that passion that Bull's talking about. It's largely financial at this stage. That that's basically. Well, also to add on answer. that, you know, I don't think the airdrops in DeFi are very good uh, methods of dis distribution. They're very, you know, you see Divergence Ventures or all these, you know, VCs. They they they're in the seed and then they 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 do the airdrops and then they dump the token day one. So like, I don't think the airdrops are really um, good methods. And our aim is like, you know, give it to people that um, you know are actually adding value. And, and they're there and they've shown that they're going to be there for the long time. So it's like avoiding any sort of freeloaders. So I don't think there's really any freeloaders in the urine organization. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's important too. And, and sometimes VCs and crypto that, you know, they're just there to, to get in the seed, get their hundred X and then they dump the tokens on retail and stuff like that. So we don't, we, you know, we don't really have any VCs that are, that are in that position um, that got the, the token price like you know an unfair discount on anyone else like the token is is free to, to buy on on you know the dexes it's on finance coinbase so you know everyone's on the same level level field there's no vc unlock uh coming in in three months and it's going to just dump all, all over retail and this also comes back to i think we're going to see more and more tools which, which we are seeing at the moment around rewarding those kind of contributions that you're talking about bull in terms of the value that people are actually providing to the system so um, tools like coordinate and so on that are, that are attempts to try and capture those contributions and a long-term commitment to the protocol yeah and coordinate is 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 a great example and it's one of the things that urine has innovated and you know uh in because it's such a decentralized um organization entity DAO, you know, however you want to call it, you know, anyone is free to contribute and you, all you have to do is come contribute, um, start poking around the telegram, the discords, talk, talk to some of the current contributors. There's something for everyone in Yearn. So I think, uh, you know, keeping the door open for everyone and it's very open, transparent and welcoming. And, you know, there's all different types of people doing, uh, you know, any sort of, uh, task or, um, activity within Yearn. It's not, solely developer so it's it's a wide variety of people and it's always open for anyone to contribute and you know as long as you're adding value you, you know i think uh you'll get rewarded um in due time 
And I think there might be a, a bit of a misnomer from folks outside Web3 that it's, oh, if I want to come play, whether it's DeFi specific or in general in any of these new protocols, I have to be a tech wizard and I need to know how to code everything in and out. And that's just not necessarily the reality. And, you know, as you were mentioning, the importance of traditional finance backgrounds and people who just know traditional treasury management, porting that over to, to crypto treasuries is very relevant. Are, are either one of you seeing any particular skill sets or knowledge bases? that are, if not lacking, at least would be helpful to have more of uh, in, in, in terms of the conversations of planning these kind of treasuries? Yeah, de definitely. And I, and I think um, it, it's definitely not solely developers. So, um, you know, we have a marketing team. We have an entire web team. You know, they're not doing the core uh, product, smart contracts you're involved. So they're, they're helping with website. And, you know, we've recently onboarded... Um, a marketing personnel that came from, you know, a large tech company that everyone would know. So, you know, he's not a Solidity developer, but he adds, you know, a lot of value in our marketing and comms front. We have very regular newsletters and um, all sorts of things to keep our community informed of what is going on. So it's, it's, it's not solely just, you know, developers, comms, legal, finance, operations, um, you know, people, kind of like an HR role, uh, all, all, all sorts of things. So it's not just developers and, you know, at the end of the day, it is a, uh, it's, it's a, it's an organization of, of a decentralized organization with people all, all throughout the world, all different backgrounds, you know, not, you know, so the door is open for anyone. And, um, I think a lot of other organizations, they lack in, um, th that other, non-technical aspect of their organizations they're solely developers they don't know about they don't have good comms they don't have good marketing they're not um you know they don't have the treasury like uh function nailed down so they're lacking in a lot of other aspects that they're overlooking i think eventually over time it's it's going to be um quite challenging for them um because these are things that you need for a, a properly functioning organization even at dow I, I completely agree. And one of the ways that we like to think about this is, yes, these ecosystems are, of course, businesses, right? And they have treasuries and they're trying to achieve some objective and so on and so forth. But we're also effectively building um, little mini economies, right? And to build an economy, you need to have a whole range of different skills to make decisions about you know, how's the token structured? How do you diversify the treasury? How do we market this? Um, what's the right level of ecosystem incentives? and or all the things that are required to build an economy generally um, have some place within these ecosystems. And I, th I think that a lot of ecosystems are getting better at coordinating this. It's seen as, it's seen as important um, to bring those people into um, the ecosystem. And, and I think that's a really healthy thing. Um, and yeah, it's great. I'm, I'm optimistic about this. Yeah, I know. Just since uh, DeFi summer uh, took hold, was it a year and a half ago or so? It's been interesting. Uh, I, I'm honestly surprised there haven't been more economists getting pulled in or, or that, uh, you know, I, uh, I know from my previous role in working at Carnegie Mellon and some of the conversations we were having there and still today, you know, lack of focus on the UI UX of some of these tools is always surprising. And I always am happy when I actually encounter one that is somewhat intuitively usable, which is a rarity in its own right. But um, regardless, uh, we're unfortunately coming to the end of our time together here. So I do just want to wrap up with a single last question of sort of uh, what are you most excited for going into the new year in terms of whether it's treasury management specifically or DeFi overall? I, I think for Yearn, uh, you know, we're having discussions of tokenomics upgrades of how, are we thinking about uh, the best way to accrue value for token holders in the community so we're ongoing discussions for that i think there's going to be a revamp that's exciting for all your token holders in the community and also you know continuing to innovate and have uh, new products coming out and um you know adding value to DeFi and the product and making it a, it a better product is, is things that i'm excited about at urine and and i think uh also just to to highlight like urine now has about two three years runway in cash covering our overhead you know, we have um, about 27 million in cash uh, that covers our expenses for, you know, 18 months, two years, two and a half years. So I think no matter what happens with Bitcoin or Ethereum or even 
um, DeFi, you know, we're going to be continuing to build, continuing to be there and continuing to add value and continuing to innovate. So um, that, these are all the things that I'm excited for. I'm excited to Dow all the things in 2022. Um, and it's really interesting having these conversations and this was this was about treasury management specifically but there's a whole range of these same conversations going on around how do you build these new types of web3 native organizations and in six months time or a year's time i'm very bullish on having a lot more information and a lot more um uh, past experience around how you solve these problems and that's really exciting for Web3 generally. We'll have a much better idea of how to manage your treasury in two months time, let alone six months time or a year. Um, and we'll have way more tools, we'll have way more talent within the ecosystems um, and that just makes me really, really excited. So it's been great to be here. I mean, in the crypto space, months is years. So yeah, it's a, it'll be interesting to see how quickly we evolve. And we do really appreciate all of you joining. And thank you to, to Chris for helping lead the conversation and to Bill and Darcy for joining. Yep, thank you very much for having me on. Thanks very much.